Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode 46 of our podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If this is your first time here, it's best to start at episode one. This is a story project, and so it goes in order. We don't want you to miss any of our tale. We're really thrilled to be reaching thousands of Tudor minded listeners from all over the world. We've had such an incredible time researching and imagining this project, and especially sharing it with all of you. And if you're enjoying it, support us. Buy some Tudor Time Machine machine swag. Go to our Tudor Time Machine Facebook page, hit the Shop Now button, and you will see all the fab items we have for sale. So get a Do You Tudor Tea or Tudor Time Machine logo sweatshirt and support the podcast at the same time. In our last episode, we saw Constance get carted away to the poultry compter prison. So in this episode, we'll follow Philomena as she tries to get a little help for her friend. After the reading, we'll have some fun discussing the history beyond our tale and making connections between then and now. Read on, Jesse. Chapter 46, Bedford House, in which Philomena receives a gift and a rebuke. The Swedish ladies were running about with great urgency, as if it were midday and not two o'clock in the morning. The princess had been there but a moment ago, yet now was not to be found, and the other ladies knew nothing of Constance's fate. They were hot with questions. Was Mistress Constance well? Why had she been taken away? I tell you true, Constance has landed in a terrible position. Do you think the princess would give her aid? Philomena asked Dorodai. The princess would, but her favour with the queen is lost. I cannot tell the result should she intervene, and we ourselves have just been told to prepare for departure to Dover, Dorodai confided. Such is the way of royals, Philomena said. Is it so? Dorodai asked. They fancy to see a mother's grave and haul off their household? I thought this particularly the Vasa way. I should have known the princess's reasoning was not so predictable. I presumed she was escaping her debts. Oh, she is that as well. Creditors banging at the door day and night, the baker climbing through the window, the vintner waiting at the water stairs. The princess has escaped them all. Dordai clapped her hands. But you, Mistress Arundel, the rooms at the inn, the festivities you have hosted for us, you have been a trusting friend. It is not a fair thing to cheat you of recompense. Dordai ran up the stairs, calling to Philomena. Come, come, Mistress. The princess's dressing room was in a state of luxurious disorder, with packing cases and boxes thrown about a fur cape draped on a table, a box of emerald rings, shoes with fine diamond buckles. Philomena thought the princess could quickly pay every one of her creditors, should she have desired to do so. By my conscience, Mistress Arundel, you will take a gift, Dordai insisted. Philomena tried a cuff set with dozens of small stones. These ear bobs would suit you well, Dordai held up two dangling pearls. Or for your girdle. This is a fine bauble, a large ruby set in gold, an item of enough worth to settle Cecilia's note. Philomena, having no idea what to do for her friend, returned to the inn. She tossed and turned all night, imagining Constance in some dingy, cold cell with lice and bedbugs. Who could help? Lady Clinton could. Yet she was a woman with many irons in the fire. Philomena had heard her husband was assembling a group of privateers and securing the patents for some type of voyage. That business would rank far above the imprisonment of a Catholic maid of honor. On the other hand, Lady Clinton had always been an advocate for Constance, and might, Philomena hoped, be willing to speak up for her. Philomena set out for Whitehall at daylight, dressed in her finest attire, her new pendant slung at her waist. The river landed her at the privy stairs. The outskirts of the palace abounded with riders and men on foot, all clambering for news of the Scottish crisis. The tower and falk pushed and shoved, a way was made for their mistress, and the gate at Whitehall Garden opened. Since Philomena's last visit, her favorite yew tree had been mercilessly pruned into the shape of a dunce cap, a victim of the gardener's desire to impress, and early spring buds were peeking out from the thawing ground. She eyed the famous sundial with its thirty ways to tell the time, 
and hoped she would have her friend freed before the cogs and shadows marked another hour. Philomena passed the welcoming guard a few coins to discover the whereabouts of the queen's ladies. The royal falconry was thick with flapping wings and screeching. Mary Howard, catching sight of Philomena, ran after her bird. Lady Mary, Philomena called, I do not come to claim a debt. I search for Lady Clinton. I do not know where she is. Everything is topsy-turvy. Tis true. The streets are full of rumours. What a bloody scene, Mary said with relish. They say Lord Darnley has killed the Scottish Queen's secretary in front of her, that they held her by the hair to stop her cries, and that blood was on her skirt, and that the babe she carries almost died in her womb. Her Majesty, our Queen Elizabeth, said she would have stabbed Lord Darnley herself had she been there. Our English Queen is stout-hearted, Philomena agreed. But I have more thought of our friend Constance Stoner than of Scotland. Because she is so happy with the Swedes, and we are so bored by the Scots? Nay, Lady Mary, Constance has been arrested. She is in the compter with the chickens. Mary's face crinkled only a fraction. Diddly poo, unfortunate is it not? Oh, well, it must be for the mass. Constance does not deserve blame for that, Philomena said. She did not go to Mass alone, after all. Do you not think the punishment too harsh? The falcon on Mary's glove glared at Philomena, while Mary busied herself adjusting its little hood. Oh, hey-ho, perhaps. Yet it is good to suffer for faith, Mary said lightly. Has not my own family already suffered hundreds of blows more than the Stoners? Courtiers nettled Philomena. Many of my relations were as thin as rails when they were let out. Oh, dear Constance, such a whippet. Will she be even thinner after prison? Mary went on. Mistress Arundel, you think me heartless. But if I have great pity, it is my bound and duty to have it for a Howard. You are from the city, mistress, and my loyalty may be difficult for you to understand. Yet I honour you. I hope we may meet again soon. Why do I not come and see you at the inn? Perhaps you are lonely with Constance in prison. I believe you and I could be fast friends. Philomena could not imagine having this girl come to the inn as an acquaintance. And yet the Howards often were in need, and they did make good on their notes. In the end, she invited Mary to visit, and the girl squeezed her hands and pranced off into the field, singing, Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn, after her little bird of prey. A few coins were passed to a page, and soon Philomena was being led to the room of Lady Clinton. High-pitched giggles came from inside. Lady Clinton already had visitors. Elan Snakenborg and the Marquis of Northampton. Ever gracious, Lady Clinton welcomed Philomena, bidding her take a chair and a glass of wine. Oh, Mistress Arundel, how happy I am to see you, Elan said, her hand closed between the two veiny hands of the Marquis. Are not the streets full of mischief? And you with no male protection? Poor Mistress Arundel, the tower and fox scowled. Elan gazed on the Marquis. Will not my lord be grand in his military garb? Indeed he shall. I had not known we were going to war, Philomena said, finding the shining face of the young girl daffyish. In good earnest, I hope so. My Marquis will be the bravest. Northampton chuckled and pulled a shiny curl. Mistress Arundel, we are to be married, I to this nymph. Elan giggled and bounced in her chair. The Marquis was a grandfather to this girl, Philomena thought, and as many men of his age believed himself reborn by youth. But it was not a shocking tableau as they sat together cooing. He was handsome and well-positioned, and she was young and lovely. A typical match. Mistress Arundel, are you well? asked Lady Clinton, tired of the May-December fawning. Very well, madam, and I have come to beg a favour. Have you not heard? asked Elin. The queen desires me as one of her maids of honour. The fates spin you a golden thread, Philomena said. I will ride out to Dover with my ladies of the queen's court, Lady Lettuce and Lady Catherine and Lady Mary, and all the other favourites of the queen, to bid adieu to my gracious lady, the Swedish princess. 
But I will not be set on the sea. My lord Marquis will ride out in turn to bring me back to my new home. What a pleasing time you shall have, Philomena smiled. She thought the queen, though clearly anxious to be rid of her Swedish guests, would not send royalty off without some ceremony. But she must waste no more time. With a deliberate head tilt, she began, There is a matter, my Lady Clinton, that presses me. I hope the Queen can spare me so the Marquis and I can go to our castle, Elin gushed. Castle Ashby is a fine place, said Lady Clinton. But Mistress Arundel? Philomena preferred to speak to Lady Clinton alone, but it was not her privilege to insist the Marquis and his kitten leave. Madam, I wish to ask of Constance Stoner. I remember the Stoner girl, the Marquis said. Under my advice, she went to serve Princess Cecilia. How well it has ended, for now my own Swedish beauty shall be mine for ever. Again, the couple lipped. Forgive me, my lord, Philomena pressed. But for Constance, it has not ended so well. She has been arrested. Lady Clinton was inscrutable. Did she know and not care? Did she not know and not care? Or did she know and care? I have been refused admittance to her, Philomena added. Oh, we must to her, cried Elin. We must bring her an orange. Elin was a peculiar girl, Philomena thought, but dissuading her would only delay. We could do so. Is it true that in your English prisons they have a hole where they put the sinners and the river rises up and drowns them? Elin inquired. Constance Stoner is surely not in such a place. Lady Clinton sounded annoyed. Shall we go to her even now? urged Philomena. This very moment, added Elin. The Marquis rose. Indeed not, said Lady Clinton. My lord. You should not risk your young lass to see such horror. She will faint away. Mistress Arundel, I will walk you out. Once out of hearing of the lovebirds, Lady Clinton spoke. Mistress Arundel, I would go alone to the Compter, though I know your desire to see your friend. But what I will say, and how Constance will find her way out of her cell, this must be between she and I. Do not fear for her. I thank you, madam. Philomena curtsied low. As she walked towards the river, Philomena considered her errand a success, even if she had not been able to see Constance. Sadly, there was nowhere to go but back to the inn. She did not want to face the inn just now. The men would be clearing away Black Jack's things, his gee-gaws, his blankets, his pretty drawings of her. By heaven, it was for the best. How often they fought and threatened. Rid of him at last. It was daunting. Philomena has appealed to everyone she can think of to help Constance in this chapter. But it's a terrible moment for Constance to get into trouble because London itself is in chaos and everyone is busy with their own concerns. And Cecilia has really burnt through whatever goodwill Queen Elizabeth had left for her. This departure of Cecilia's is based on the real events of her final days in England. It's kind of a tangled situation because Elizabeth got wind of a number of transgressions by Cecilia in a short space of time. So one of those was Cecilia's continued contact with Dr. Delanoy. Delanoy had promised the Queen that through his unique alchemical process that he claimed to have, he would make her gold. She had paid his way to London and had paid for him to remain there and to have a laboratory. But Elizabeth was getting tired of waiting for this gold to be made. Was she surprised by his <laughs> failure? I mean, that seems a little crazy. Well, I think she was probably second-guessing the outlay she had made in funding him because at this point in the early spring of 1566, Elizabeth actually had Delanoy put under house arrest. And one of her issues with the alchemist, along with his failure to make gold, was that he was in continual contact with Princess Cecilia. So it's not entirely clear what Elizabeth feared was going on between Delanoy and Cecilia, but they were certainly aware that Delanoy was selling things for Cecilia in secret so she could keep the cash and not pay her debts, which seemed to be her entire goal in life. Or her <laughs> raison d'etre. Her raison d'etre was to make debts and then not pay them. <laughs> so Elizabeth was so angry 
because she was getting complaints about these debts from tradespeople, and they appealed to her to pay Cecilia's debts. So you know she was not having that. And she had given Cecilia an allowance to stay in London. It's I mean, cr- that's the thing is that, you know, Elizabeth was like, I gave you a generous allowance. What are you doing? She had also paid for Cecilia to stay there. Selling things for Cecilia was beneficial for Delanois because he would take a little fee for the transaction actions. And that was money which he was also trying to keep out of the Queen's notice because he didn't want her to think that he was making gold because he wasn't. (laughs) So Elizabeth banned any contact between Delanois and Cecilia, but of course they continued to correspond. Right. I mean, when you have servants and people, you can find ways to correspond, right? So when Elizabeth found that out, she had Delanois arrested and taken to prison. The situation at Bedford House just got more and more chaotic. There were stories of creditors breaking through the windows and doors and demanding payment. And apparently a butcher even threatened the household with a meat cleaver. And of course, Delanois excuse, his reason for why the gold wasn't being made, was that he was being given evil spells by other alchemists. So he wasn't able to achieve this goal. When you're dealing with something like alchemy, it's pretty easy to make excuses as to why it's not working out so well. (laughs) But to add to this, at this point, you know, the Earl of Bedford comes back to London from his military duties at the border of Scotland and England, and he found his once beautiful, pristine mansion on the Strand kind of a complete wreck from all the partying Cecilia and her household had done there. There was nicks in the wood, there were broken windows, there were stains on the furniture. He's like, oh my God. What the hell? He must have just blown a (laughs) gasket. He lent the house to gain favor with Princess Cecilia, but it turned out she was crazy and also had no money. And I'm sure Queen Elizabeth did not come forward to help pay for the repairs to his house, and probably he got nothing from her either. We know that when Cecilia came to London, Queen Elizabeth was like, I'm going to do you the great honor, Earl of Bedford, of having this princess stay in your home. It was supposed to have been a way to to kind of make points with Elizabeth as well. But it just, it was a total, you know, totally bust for him. And also it wasn't as if anybody could appeal to Cecilia's brother, King Eric of Sweden, to wrangle his sister or to pay her debts. Let's be honest, there was a little element of madness in this family, the Vasa family. And Eric was showing more and more signs of real insanity. He had fits of wild anger, paranoia, depression, very erratic, violent behavior. And on top of all this, he was scandalizing his court and the rest of Europe by elevating his mistress, Karen Mann's daughter, to be his wife. And I think Elizabeth must have thought, thank God I didn't marry him. It was considered a scandal because Karen had been a maidservant at court. But I think she actually must have been a pretty incredible woman because she rose from being the daughter of peasants. She was illiterate when Eric first noticed her and made her his mistress, but she learned how to read and write. And apparently she was the only person who could reason with Eric when he was in his worst moments of insanity. Right. And of course, we look at that and we think that's amazing, right? That he would love somebody like that. But at this period, the idea that a king would respond to somebody like that and elevate them in that way was against all ideas of the way the structure of society should be. Eric really loved her. Of course, Karen was accused of putting a spell on him, you know, so only she could control him. There's no surprise there. And eventually Eric did marry her. But within a few years, he became so unstable that he was deposed and they were separated and they actually had children together and they never saw each other again. So sort of sad. It and is Eric sad. kind of languished away. All this crazy in Sweden made things worse for Cecilia in England because her king brother was too out of it to intervene. And meanwhile, Cecilia's husband, Christoph the Margrave, snuck back into England from the continent with a plan to smuggle Cecilia out of London without her creditors knowing. That seems like an insanely expensive complicated. and complicated <laughs> plan instead of just giving the creditors or well, working it out, them. right? Or even a part of what you owe them, right? Yes. But to be super, super careful about this plan, he disguised himself in a false beard and a wig to evade his own numerous English creditors. 
It just seems very, very thin. <laughs> very thin. I mean, a false beard is not going to get you very far in England. Where you are a Margrave, you have a Germanic accent and an entourage. Yes. You think it's hard to be incognito like that? Yes. Well, guess what? The plan <laughs> failed because his creditors, who were always on the lookout for him, got wind of his return and he was captured and imprisoned. Well, then is now not paying your debts gets you into a boatload of trouble. Yeah, and I wonder if he was fleeing debts in his in his own country. Probably. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I've got this beard and these false whiskers. They <laughs> shall protect me. But Elizabeth did intervene on his behalf. She had him released, but that was it. She basically made it clear to Cecilia that now was the time to depart from London. So Cecilia pawned all of her remaining goods to fund the trip back home and began packing up. But of course, she didn't use any of the money she got from pawning her things to pay even a penny to her creditors. So this is the scene at Bedford House that Philomena walks into. They, they are not ready to listen to, you know, any domestic problems. <laughs> no, I mean, Dorodai feels bad for Constance, right? But there's not much anybody can do. Philomena is like, all right, that's not working. I've got to go somewhere else. So she goes to Whitehall. And this is the first time we've seen her there. It's kind of where the city meets the court. And even though Philomena is distracted by her, her desire to help Constance, even she can't help but notice these amazing gardens and the sundial of Whitehall when she comes in from the London streets, you know? No, it must have been quite a thing to step from the dirty city into this sprawling, well-tended, rolling, massive garden mm -hmm. of the buildings that have been lost to us. I think Whitehall is the one I would most like to see. It was rebuilt by Henry VIII, so it was kind of a Tudor show place in 1565, when we see Philomena there, it would have been a modernish building. And then all the subsequent tutors lived there, Holbein's portraits hung there. I'm sure if it survived, we would have so many more wonderful letters, articles, even pomanders. <laughs> Who knows what we lost, but it, it all burnt in 1692. I would love to see where the ladies lived and just how all that worked. At this time, the area around Whitehall was not built up. There was a big hunting ground behind it. It had several incarnations during the Tudor period, which is normal, right? Well, a sort of new reign, you want to put your stamp on yes. it, right? And we love to remodel now, and they yeah, like to they... remodel then. So we have a few descriptions of how it changed over time. And in 1584, one royal visitor describes the garden as having 34 high columns. Wow covered with various fine paintings. That's crazy. Outdoor paintings. It's good to have servants to move your Michelangelos and Holbeins around so you can see them as much as you would like. I just can't even think about all the art that was lost when Whitehall burned. Yeah, no, it's terrible. Another contemporary said that there was art, again, columns, flags with the Queen's insignia, and in the middle of the garden, a nice fountain with a remarkable sundial showing the time in 30 different ways. That sundial was very Mm -hmm. famous because of the many ways it could express the time. The basic technology for a sundial is very old, even in the Tudor period. Unbelievably, the first sundial with an arm to tell the hour that we know of was developed in 575 BCE. So that is a long time ago. And that's the one we know of, right? So right. it could have even predated that. And the Tudors were very mathematical and scientific, as we've said before. And from the 1500s through the 1700s, they just kept improving the way to measure and calculate the Earth's relationship to the sun. I'm living in the 21st century, and I can't understand any of it. They were way ahead of me. <laughs> yes, it's true. But it's why they were such great cartographers. Yeah. Even though mechanical clocks were invented in the 14th century for a really precise time, you relied on the sundial. And they even invented a wrist sundial. I read that until the late 1800s, they would use a sundial to adjust mechanical clocks, make sure everything was on the right time. So this sundial was state of the art. I'm sure the queen loved that. Everyone always likes to show off a new gadget. 
Yes, see my new phone? It's a Tudor G. <laughs> <laughs> then is now. I'm sorry we lost the sundial too. That would have been another thing to see at Whitehall. When Philomena finally finds Mary Howard out there with her birds, she's way too busy with her Gwendolyn to be of any help. So Philomena is off to try to find someone else to help Constance. And she thinks about Lady Clinton. But Lady Clinton is pretty distracted by the May-December fawnings of Northampton on Ellen Snakenborg. Yeah, so it's funny because in all this crazy, Elin is kind of the only person who's really happy. And in real life, Elin was actually the only person who truly benefited from Cecilia's trip to London. Queen Elizabeth didn't, but Elin did. And she actually did stay in London at the request of Queen Elizabeth. Who did it for William Parr, the Marquess of Northampton. Yes, because he really was passionately in love with this 16-year-old Swedish girl. And he wanted to marry her. But he had his own complications because he had made a very unfortunate first marriage that was really not his not fault. Not his fault. Yeah, because his mother wanted him to marry an heiress. And so he was married at 13 to a 10-year-old heiress, Anne Borchier. And obviously, as we've talked about before, you know, when couples were 13 and 10, they didn't live together. And so they waited until they were of age, but they did not get along at all. And when she was 22, Anne eloped with her lover. She was had her own money and she was like, I'm not living with you, William yes. Carr. I'm off. So not eloped in that they got married. No, you're right. She ran away with him. So she had a son by him. Mm -hmm. And because she was still married to William Parr, he was named John Parr. So of course, William Parr feared that this child that was not his mm -hmm. would claim his estates because he was technically born within a married state. So he convinced Parliament to declare his marriage to Anne void because of her adultery. You could obtain a divorce, which meant that you didn't have to live with your wife who had committed adultery, but it was very hard to actually dissolve a marriage, to annul a marriage, to make it that that marriage had never happened. And Parr's desire was to get married again. So it was very complicated. At this time, his sister Catherine Parr happened to be the sixth wife of Henry VIII. So Parliament kind of granted an annulment, but it was always a little questionable. And Parr did get to marry his second wife, Elizabeth Brooke. But that marriage was always under scrutiny. In some years, it was considered valid. Some years, it was considered not valid. Then it was considered valid again. And Elizabeth Brooke died in 1565. We talked a little bit about her in the beginning of the book because actually she was a great friend of Lady Clinton's. In 1565, Parr's wife, Anne, is still alive. So as you can imagine, the church denied his request to marry Elin. Yeah. They still felt that the annulment was not valid. But I think it was okay for Elin because she yeah. was only 16. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe right. she, had time maybe to wait. she didn't want to. I mean, no, I'm, I'm projecting. She was taken into Elizabeth's household as a maid of honor, and she must have done quite a good job because subsequently she was elevated to a lady of the privy chamber and given her own rooms at Hampton Court, her own servants, and her own horses, which was quite a mark of favor from Elizabeth, who didn't like to give things like that away. We've made this observation a few times in this podcast, and it's kind of a general theme for us, is when you read about some of these ladies-in-waiting, you always hear that they were the queen's favorite. You hear that they were the queen's favorite and that they were the most beautiful. It's really hard to know exactly what was going on. Everybody wants to have their own candidate. You can even read that Elizabeth Brooke was a closer advisor to Elizabeth I than Robert Dudley. So many people said she was her favorite. Right. And then some people say Lady Clinton was her favorite. Yes, absolutely. And then they've known each other since childhood. Right. It's always a little dodgy when you read that someone was the most favorite or the most beautiful. Because yeah. apparently everybody was the most beautiful. But look, they that's good. We'll, 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 we'll spread the love around. Elin continued to be feted by the rich and powerful Marquess of Northampton. And finally, in 1571, when Parr's first wife, Anne, died, they got married. Yeah. But then he only lived a few months after their wedding. Which, after all that waiting. Yes, it is yeah. either sad or not sad. I don't know. She's a 20-something widow. She has a lot of money, and she has some beautiful estates. So mm -hmm. she's actually in great, sh great I mean, shape. Yeah. <laughs> She's in great shape. So she didn't just run into another marriage. She waited, and then she found the right person, Sir Thomas George. They lived happily ever after, and they had eight children. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it all worked out for it Elin. It all worked out for Elin. And in 1603, because of her high status, she was the chief mourner at the funeral of Queen Elizabeth I. Quite a journey for this teenage maid of honor from Sweden. But that's all in the future. In our chapter, Elin is way too interested in her own fate to give much thought to Constance having been arrested. Philomena appeals to Lady Clinton, and we're going to hope that Lady Clinton can actually help Constance get out of jail, but we're going to have to wait until our next episode to find out what happens with that. All and right. meanwhile, Philomena has to go back to the inn where Blackjack <laughs> has moved all his things. He's moved out. That's, That's very, very sad for her. So join us next time for more Times Riddle and more tutor minded talk. <laughs>